Hey, one of the things we've been about since the beginning is not only teaching the Word, but you know, helping people hear from God and helping them develop a, a relationship with God. Maybe some weren't aware of His salvation offering or didn't know about the gifts they'd already been given or could be given. Natural gifts or gifts in the Holy Spirit. And so, tonight we want to continue that in listening to the Lord. Because with the psalm we're in tonight, there's places where You need to be the one to fill in the blank, not me. So, we're going to uh, read through the psalm and pray a bit, and then when I was in prayer and you know, got all these cross-references and life lessons like we usually do, and I said, Lord, you know, after I read the psalm, what do you... What do you want to go to first? <clears throat> That's what he said. He was quiet and it encouraged me to be quiet. And at first I thought... God's never too busy to answer us. So his answer is an answer. And, and when he's quiet, he may be encouraging us to be quiet and to be okay with it. There are, interestingly enough, a couple of things management people do in hiring and firing, one of the things they do is let there be a silence in the interview and see if the person feels like they've got to fill it. Because that's not always a good sign. The other thing they often do is go out to lunch or dinner with them and watch how they treat the wait staff. Because the theory goes, and this is a secular business theory, not necessarily a Christian one, so, but it's based on uh, Christian teachings. They watch to see how the person treats the wait staff, with the theory being that's how they feel about people. Hmm. So let's turn to Psalm 51, and this is a, a, a very important psalm in the Psalms, and of course these are, this is a song book we're reading from, and this is a, um, one of the songs in the song book. It's Psalm 51, so if you'll turn there with me. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. If you're online, there's a little button down below. You can click on that. And that's... Um, boy, that looked different. I was, at, I was at Isaiah 51. I had the number right. It said 51. <laughs> Praise God. I read the first verse. And I thought, what version is this? Praise God. Psalm 51. And this is in the truest sense a cross road for David. That time doesn't allow us but let me encourage you to go back and read the story of David. 
concerning the part of Bathsheba and Uriah and it's messy, it's bad. It's shocking to see the man called you know, who has a the man who has a heart after God. What all he did. And when you read the story, what, what you'll notice first is it started with the eyes. Because David was up on the roof and saw a friend's wife up on the roof bathing, somebody that had served him faithfully and well. But it was downhill from there. Now it's interesting because you have to go to Samuel to read about that. It's interesting companion, comparing Samuel and Chronicles. Well, Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. Because they have some of the same information. And they do not have some of the same information. It's interesting what's in there, the same, and what's not. The perspective we gain looking at history there is Samuel and Kings sort of give a man's, uh, how it looked to us. When you go into Chronicles, it, it's very different. It's how God saw it. Samuel goes into great length about what happened. It's very interesting what Chronicles does with David and Bathsheba. It's not in there. Not in the same version, not in the same form. Well, why is that? Because Chronicles is looking with God's perspective. Now this is, I call this a crossroad. I understand, this is the point, there was a man, Nathan, who was a prophet, who came to David and described a man who had gone to a man that only had one sheep when this person owned many, many sheep. He went and took a friend's single sheep, the only sheep he had, the only lamb he had. And took it. Nathan paints the picture. It's a realistic picture. And David, who loves truth and justice and loves the Lord, is angered hearing about this man. And then Nathan, hearing from the Lord, <clears throat> importantly, with unknown, untold love and compassion for David. Nathan says, you are the man. Now David, like Joseph and others before him, was at the crossroad. You could have gone you know, at least one of a couple different ways. David could have decided to continue in his sin and say, <clears throat> Nathan, say goodbye to your head. He was the king. There wouldn't be a, a trial or a court or anything. This is before the Magna Carta and all that. So the king made the decision, execution, carried out right there. But that's not what David did. He broke 
before Nathan and more importantly before the Lord. Now why is this in here? Well, all scripture is given that we might learn from it. When we go through this chapter and I'll read through it and try to not comment on the first read through. I don't want you thinking of David or, or Nathan. I want you to think of you and your relationship with the Lord. Now I know in this day and age and culture we're constantly re redefining words including sin. Sin's just a little off the mark. You'll hear a lot about sin being leaven and it is in the Bible. It's a symbol of sin, leaven is. There's another symbol that I think is probably far more accurate that we refer to far less. Leprosy is a picture of sin in the Bible. And before I read this chapter, imagine if this was your inspection for leprosy. What would be weighing in the balance? Life and death. Eternal life and death. So, what are the weights of sin? The Bible answers that. The wages of sin is death. So, leprosy is very, very serious. Sin is far more serious. Because tonight as we read through this, I'm not sure if anybody in here, anybody listening, has leprosy. I do know every person listening, every person online, every person that will listen to this recording, the person speaking, the people backstage, all of us have the disease of sin. Now, Jesus died that we could be cured and healed in every way, spiritually, physically, emotionally, from the effects of sin. And hopefully you've received that grace, that mercy. You've been born again. You asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins. That's awesome. And then the work continues with Jesus and the Holy Spirit purifying us. As this nation has gone through some real changes I've watched and listened to some quickly you know, jump up and begin prophesying and, and during the beginning of the pandemic I felt this nation was at a crossroads it has nothing to do with either party well, has to do with both of them. Whether either of them or anybody in either of them is really listening to God. And it's fairly obvious some are either not listening to God or actually listening to God and declaring war on Him and His truth and His word. Which number goes well. So, as we go through this psalm, if 
you're a citizen of the United States and you think everything's hunky-dory, it's not. Far from it. Things are happening with a breath taking speed. So what is the believer to do when we see all these things happening? The danger is focusing on the things happening and not what the things happening announce. I do believe we have entered into a state of judgment in this nation. Now, if you're a believer, that in part is good news. And we may tonight get to some of the scriptures that tell us what to look out for in the last days. But let's get back to the the first thing we began talking about, and that's hearing from God. Now, God wants to speak to all of us, each of us. What are the competing voices in your life? In other words, who or what might be keeping you from hearing from the Lord? That's one thing right there, isn't it? I recently put the phone down for a couple days, so if you've texted me, excuse me if I've taken a little longer than usual to reply. Let's read this psalm and we'll pray before and pray after and then we'll sit before the Lord and see what he speaks to each of us. And then we'll look at some other verses and reference and And each of us will have a chance to respond. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you you warn the ones you love. And the ones that love you listen. Lord, help us to see these scriptures that announce things that are here and things that are coming are written out of love and concern and also out of warning. Lord, if we see a child that we love or maybe even their own child out in the street. We will warn them because we care. So Lord, thank you for this love, this care, this encouragement, and this warning. Lord, I don't know at this moment how each person needs to apply this chapter Lord I could I could suppose I could hypothesize I could guess and Lord having known so many of these folks for years some of those guesses would be pretty close But God, I 
I am far more grieved by my sins than the sins of anyone else. And Lord, my prayer, your word, your spirit, would have each person listening be far more concerned where they have broken God's law and how the person beside them, behind them, in front of them, speaking to them, in any of their sense, Lord, may they be the most concerned about their own because those are the ones they can do something about. Lord, none of us can repent for one another. We can only repent for ourselves. And Lord, help us to understand that in the New Testament when you over and over again said repent, that was not an invitation. It was an instruction, a command. So Lord, thank you. Thank you that these scriptures we read tonight are filled with your love, just as sure as John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Lord, thank you for this love and care. And may your Holy Spirit and the washing of your word continue to purify each and every one of us listening so that others may be drawn to the kingdom. And secondarily, that we may know the blessings of obedience. Thank you for your word. Thank you for a place where it is still read and it is still listened to. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. In Hashem Yahshua, the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Psalm 51. There's a slight heading to the top there it says to the chief musician a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba short intro version of a lot of things that happened so then verse 1 actually begins with have mercy Upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin, my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge verse 5 behold I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me born in sin every one of us were Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part 
you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Mm. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. For your word, for this word, Lord, we ask that you would give us a broken and contrite heart for our sins. Give us a broken and contrite heart over the innocent blood spilled in this land. Lord, tonight 
humbling ourselves. May we choose you. Four hundred years ago, Lord, we we chose you at Plymouth Rock. This nation did. We chose life over death, work over stealing, and your ways over man's ways. Lord, one of the reasons we're broken tonight is after 400 years, we now have chosen death over life as a nation, as a people. We've chosen stealing over work. And we've chosen our ways and our wisdom above you and your wisdom. Lord, thank you for seeing things and understanding. Lord, thank you for being able to prayerfully look at the things going on and see very plainly they are coming for the church they are coming for people who believe in you and put you first Lord if we wait to choose you till that day we won't choose you tonight we once again choose you. We as individuals and as a community of faith and perhaps as a remnant, God, we choose your ways, not our ways. We choose life over death. We choose work over stealing. Lord, help us to listen to you. Listen to your word. Listen to those who share with us, teach us, instruct us. Lord, you tell us in your word, those those people are sent as gifts from you. Help us to be thankful. Let's just each take a few moments and sit before the Lord. You may want to have something to write with, a piece of paper. The Lord may speak a verse to you. May flash a face of somebody you need to forgive. Somebody you need to pray for, perhaps witness to. He might show you an area in your life you are compromised in. And he will leave the decision to you to stay there or to choose him. Lord, thank you. Lord, that we're reading your word and we are listening. Mm. Lord, we ask that your word, your Holy Spirit, would speak to us, would teach us, would instruct us. Lord, help
help us to develop a spiritual listening ear for the times and the seasons will come where our very lives depend upon it. Lord, thank you. Thank you again. Lord, these things we're watching, they're not about red, blue, Trump, Biden, Democrats, Republicans, North, South, white, black, U.S., other countries. It's not about the mark of the beast. It's not about the vaccine. It's not about the pandemic. not even about the rapture or the second coming or the tribulation. Lord, if we could summarize everything that's going on in a few sentences or a few words, (laughs) we can you are coming back. Lord, thank you that we can see the signs. And Lord, tonight, may we listen to you and respond to you. And from this point on, may we focus on you and on others as you have taught us and commanded us. Let's listen for the Lord and to the Lord for a few moments.
Lord, thank you that we can be still and know you are God. Lord, thank you for a moment of quiet joy with you. A cleansing time with you. Instead of the busyness and the voices of the world. Lord, thank you for the, the beautiful pictures of the Holy Spirit. Be in the wind. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would blow through us. Blow out the dust of selfishness and sin. Lord, blow out the parts of us that want to wound others instead of love them. Blow out the parts that are not of you. Lord, thank you that the Holy Spirit is water. Washing our lives, washing our minds, washing our hearts, changing us. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is fire. Burning out and consuming the chaff in our lives. Providing heat so like gold is a symbol of purity in your word refines with heat the impurities come to the surface and are scraped off by the refiner who knows when he sees his image the refinement is finished Lord, in the heat of our relationships, when we do things and say things, and we step back and we look at them, and think, well, that is so not like me. May we realize that is us. In the heat of the battle, in the heat of an argument. So we, may we not give you false claims about that's not like us. May we plainly see that is what we are like sometimes. But not what we want to be like. Lord, we desire your hand in our lives. While others you've created may step off the pottery wheel, Lord, tonight we step on. And Lord, help us not to wonder what you're doing at every moment with the clay in our lives. But to trust the potter. to trust you. And Hashem Yeshua, the name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's go back through this chapter now and look at some other scriptural references that might help us understand
the words a little more deeper, maybe a little more personally. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Notice verse 3 says, my transgressions, my sins are always before me. Now, David had known some pretty serious sinners in his life. I mean, not the least of which was the king he so faithfully served and never spoke against. And what he learned serving under King Saul made sure when he stepped into being king that he would not be King Saul. Notice all the personal pronouns in here. It's not have mercy on us, have mercy on me. Not according to some loving kindness, not according to your loving kindness, not mine, God, not the, mo- not the loving kindness of people, not the loving kindness of the world, which really isn't any in the world. Isaiah 59, chapter 59, verse 3 through 8 says this, For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. That's amazing. I didn't know they had CNN back then, but that is... <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> they conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper's eggs and weave the spider's eggs. He who eats of their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. This is interesting, some of the language in here. The spider's web. Verse 6 says, Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. We have to realize a couple of things. First of all, God is trying to influence us through his word, through his spirit. We also need to realize that we have been influenced since birth by everything around us. TV, internet, school, clubs, colleges. Uh, I, it's a large number I can't remember the exact one of how many images we see every day and they're usually not images of being thankful 
being godly, but just the opposite. Now, we're tempted to, to read this, spider's eggs, and oh, my goodness. Pastor David, what have you been doing? It sounds like you really need to repent. <laughs> yeah, you should have do. Any person that loves the Lord should often repent. First John chapter 1, verse 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're pretty good Christians. Oh, wait a minute. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and how do we know if we're doing that? We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. Not our actions or our activities, His blood. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. That's one choice tonight. If you're here, you're listening, you can say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I don't really struggle with sin. Hmm. Well, there's two kind of believers. The kind that struggle with sin. The kind that don't. I hope you're not the believer who does not struggle with that. The believers that do not struggle with sin have already gone before us. They no longer have the, the flesh motivating, consuming, and which is a, can be a really, really deceptive thing for the Christian. So that's one choice. Or say, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, second choice, much better choice. If we confess our spouse's sins, no, that's not what it says. If we confess our neighbor's sin, no. If we confess our pastor's sin, no. If we confess our presidents, no. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Much better choice. And then John goes back to the first one again. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, Jesus, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Two verses before that, if I could intro that verse, First John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. And then he what, talks about happy, feel-good, encouragement stuff. No. Talks about repenting and confessing. Why? That's where joy comes from. That's one of the big sources of joy in our life. As we get one thing after another out of the way, out from between us and God. And every time we do, it's a great joy and a great celebration. And usually we wonder why we didn't do it before. Against you, you only have us sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. I tell you, that's a tricky one. Now, it's obvious we sin primarily against God and God alone. 
And yet this is David. And if you don't know the story, David cheated with Bathsheba. Probably had a chance to repent, but he didn't. Then he decided to try to get the husband involved. So when she got pregnant, it became you know, his. That didn't work. So he's lying, scheming now. When that doesn't work, he conspires to murder a man who's protected him. So David's sin, while against the Lord primarily, and in some ways against the Lord alone, boy, it sure affected a bunch of people. Hmm. Verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. There's what's theologically called uh, original sin. That means you and I and every human born was born in sin. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, if you believe that man is basically good, that's not what the Bible teaches. And one of the things, one of the main things we're saved from is not just selfishness and sin. The Bible takes a lot of time to communicate that the gospel saves us from ourselves. Because it is us that has damaged relationships. It is us who've not always done the right thing the Lord was leading us to do. It is us that, you know, did always not do the wrong thing. Did we said wrong things. And we can defend those things. Or we can repent. But we can't do both. So you can defend your sins or hand your sins to God. Hmm. Psalm 58 verse 3 says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf cobra. Stops its ears. Stops its ear. Excuse me. Behold, verse 6, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Hmm. Job, chapter 38, verse 32. So can you bring out Maseroth in its season? Now that's the forerunner of the zodiac that we had mentioned recently. The Zodiac is a corrupted version of the Maseroth, which is the seasons of the sky telling the story of the gospel. If you've ever wondered why Virgo the Virgin is holding a baby in the Zodiac, now you know. It's speaking about the Messiah. There's all these things in the sky that announce his first coming and announce his second coming. Amazing. Can you bring out Maseroth in its season? Or can you, God, the great bear with its cups, can you move the stars? Can you set up these constellations? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the mind? Who has given understanding to the heart? 
Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can pour out the bottles of heaven? No human. God can. But I cannot, and and you cannot. Hmm. So some of this can, if, if you, it's interesting. If you stop halfway, if you're half baked in what you hear tonight, you're going to be miserable. Why? Because if you half hear, what you'll hear is, oh, I need to feel really bad about the things I've done. That should never be the goal of Christianity. That leaves you in a bad place. I know because it's happened to me over and over. When I was 16, I had a teacher, actually one of the teachers that cared about me, said the best thing that could happen to me was somebody leave me dead in a ditch, at least it'd be over. So we have this ability to hurt one another. It's pretty incredible, actually. And we have a far more incredible ability to love one another. But the love that God requires from us for one another is not humanly capable. He can do it through us. We cannot do it of ourselves. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. It's always amazing. watching snow always think of this verse and look at the the purity the the whiteness of snow every snowflake different purge purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean that's a really interesting reference for a couple reasons first of all it's been found that hyssop is a very good thing to use in cleansing your body. But this is also a reference that you would use hyssop to put the lamb's blood on the door. And that's the intended reference here. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. As a matter of fact, when we go to the reference here, uh, Isaiah 1, 18. We'll look at a few verses before and after. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. It's amazing how many people are anti-God crying out for their version of justice. And they criticize God. Well, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, whole world be blind. The reason God said that is man had this propensity that he, he had this ability that if somebody put his eye out, he usually killed the guy. And God was saying, 
That's not balanced. If you lose an eye, he loses an eye. If he knocks your tooth out, you don't get the shooting. <laughs> he loses a tooth. It limited the retribution and the vengeance. And you can be really, really sure of this. Anybody that doesn't know God has no idea what justice is. None. Understand, we believe at the end of our life we will appear before the Lord. There are people who do not believe that. Who do not believe they will ever be held accountable for their actions. They're very, very wrong. And you know what they're wagering on it? Their eternal life. Bad bet. To wash yourselves, make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. And then it, it, it gets fans in verse 17. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And then comes verse 18. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We're going to jump down and jump through some life lessons here before we close. One of the things that we do as people, it's not hard to see if you'll stop and think this through, is we judge ourselves by our intentions. Hey, I didn't see it at church Sunday. Oh, you know, I meant to be there. So it's okay. And then we show up one Sunday and go, hey, where's Joe? He ain't ever here, man. Maybe Joe intends to be there as well. So here's a life lesson. We judge ourselves by our intentions, what we meant to do. And we judge others by their actions, not their intentions. It gives ourselves an unfair comparison so that we look good and everyone else looks bad. That's what each one of us does. If you say you don't do this, whoo, you're probably really good at it or really bad at it. So each of us have to realize, look, I'm, that's me. That's you. That's us. And God says, my spirit can lift you above that. It can lift you to the point where you judge your actions. And in love, begin to understand what others may have intended to do. A big lesson for us, it's interesting, you read John 8, don't turn there, we don't have time tonight, but in John 8, Jesus speaks to the adulterous woman. Beautiful picture of grace and forgiveness. And surely at that point, you know, Amy Grant was singing and the choir was closing and tears were flowing. Everybody was getting the lesson of he who is without sin cast the first stone. Apparently not. Because if you're reading the text and you don't stop at the end of that chapter, you immediately come to the John 9 where they're walking past a blind man and the disciples steeped in this amazing show of grace and mercy 
for the forgiven woman, walk past the blind man and say, can we pray for him? Can you heal him? Can we have love and compassion for this guy? Is that what they said? No. Who sinned, him or his parents, that he's like that? What happened to John 8? What happened to... Anybody who doesn't know sin be the first to throw the rock. That's what we're capable of in our flesh. That's what our flesh wants to do. Point out the mistakes. Not forget the potential mistakes of others. Because here's another thing. When we get sick, oh, well, it's the Lord trying to teach us something. When somebody else gets sick, I wonder what they did. It must have been pretty bad. They're pretty sick. Wow. We have to realize as we read the Bible to see certain things, certain tendencies in man. And when I say man, you know, mankind, both sex. Here's the next one. Unfortunately, at times... No one recognized the sacrifices of Jesus. At times, we don't recognize the ones sacrificing to bless us. Let's say it again. Unfortunately, at times, no one recognized the sacrifice of Jesus. And at times, we don't recognize the ones sacrificing to bless us. If you want to argue with that point, have you really always honored your mom and dad and appreciated the sacrifices they made? No, none of us have. Have you always held your political leaders in prayer? Maybe. There's an interesting exchange in, in Exodus, which is just really good for anybody going in the ministry. And, and we're not going to do a big, big study. I just want to know the moment in there. And, and if you can understand, this is when Moses has been melted by the desert into what God intended him to be. Molded. Being a shepherd, fighting injustice, protecting the well. Interesting. He has this encounter with the bush, with the Lord. Feels he's called to be the deliverer. So he goes in to Pharaoh, the most powerful person in the world. We fail to recognize the significance of that moment. He walked in there and said, let all of your slaves go. Have you thought about what Pharaoh could have said? Because I tell you, with four words, Exodus would have been a much shorter book. (laughs) Off with your head. Nobody challenges Pharaoh like that. Take him away. As a matter of fact, a lot of leaders wouldn't say take him away. They do it right here. Let everybody see it. It's amazing the cruelty of people. And one of the things, God, God told Israel not to copy the people they moved into the land with. And one of the reasons you see it later a king who was wanting to punish a king of Israel. And this is in the Bible. In front of him killed his family. And then, so that was the last thing he ever saw, they scorched his eyes out. 
what we don't even realize is that was a normal practice of that particular king. So Moses goes in to Pharaoh and speaks to him and says, hey, you know, let my people go. Just like God told them to do. And so Moses, I mean, and, and Aaron, their life is on the line. And so when they come out, you know, Pharaoh makes this decree, well, you know what? I'm going to make it harder. Make bricks without straw. And incidentally, you won't see this on the Discovery Channel probably, but there are whole layers of brick in Egypt made without straw. Under them, bricks with straw, bunch without, and then more bricks with straw. Famine would not have done that. Drought wouldn't have done it because they saved the straw to build with. Interesting. So they, you know, Moses came out and everybody said, man, thanks for trying, Mo. We love you. We'll be praying for you. No, this is Moses' first public ministry experience. What happens? Again, you don't need to turn there. It it ends up in chapter 5, verse 20. It says, then as they came out from Pharaoh, the people, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And in verse 21 of chapter 5, they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses did that. Or did he? What a twisted little verse. Because Pharaoh was a murderer. And um, he, he massacred their children. And when one guy finally spoke out against him, they turned on him. And say, so, you know, Pharaoh's our buddy. What are you doing? We were friends before you walked in there. We can learn a lot through the children of Israel. Poor, poor. And I know we don't like to see ourselves, but we need to look for ourselves in that. What was one of the things they did all along the path to the, the promised land? We wish it was like it used to be. It was so good in Egypt. The garlic and the onion and when they were killing our babies. And Next life lesson. Quit longing for what used to be. And focus on what could be if you were fully engaged. Stop whining and wanting to go back to Egypt. Let me read that one again. Quit longing for what used to be and focus on what could be if you were fully engaged. Stop whining and wanting to go back to Egypt. Keith Green wrote a bunch of songs about that. I'm not the first to mention that. And if each and every one of us are honest tonight, there's a part of us when it gets really hard. A part of us wants to give up. Pastor, surely you've never thought that or felt that. probably every day since we started. The Lord won't let me. And he won't let you. If you leave it up to him. And we start talking about 
repenting and asking forgiveness for our sins and the things we've done. We're going to close with this too. Realize there was two big ministry moments for Jesus. One was the cross. The other one came three years earlier. Have you ever wondered why Jesus would choose to be a carpenter? His father was a carpenter. Why would he choose to be a carpenter? Daily working with a hammer, nails, and wood. The real ministry moment for Jesus, it really, in some ways, it's it's not really spoken of. It was the day that he was just Joseph's son. Seemed pretty smart when you talked to him, pretty sharp. But the carpenter's son in Galilee. Do you realize he could have chose that and stayed that? Who could have blamed him? Do you realize he could have waited to come the first time? Till instead of eight grueling hours on the cross, he could have just gone to the electric chair. But he did. He chose a far more painful path. And he stepped out one day. And he was no longer just Jesus, Joseph's son. He stepped into the Messiah show. He stepped into the fullness of what God was calling him to. And the, the wonder of that all is before he ever stepped out, he knows what's going to happen. He knows. Three years. Of tauntings, of being accused, of being a demon possessed, being dishonest, being illegitimate. God being illegitimate. And so he said, you know what? I don't need these people hating on me. I'm going back in the shop. Is that what he did? Later he knew what was waiting in Jerusalem. He told the guys, we're we're going here because they're going to kill me. And they didn't believe him. They didn't get it. What happens to you in those ministry moments when you could step out? Do you? If 
Here's the next life lesson. Jesus died for our sins before we were born. He paid for our sins before we had personally committed our first sin. Jesus died for our sins before we were born. He paid for our sins before we had personally committed our first sin. That's amazing. So now as we read the word and the word reads us, we respond. And we respond one of two ways. We respond, you know what, I'm okay. I, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm okay, Christian. I'm good. Thank you. That's your choice to make. To not respond to Jesus knocking on the door calling you to repentance. And First John's pretty clear on what that choice involves. Or you can choose to repent. To ask God, wash me. Cleanse me. If there's something bad in me, God, show it to me. Let's get it worked out and done with. Lord, thank you that you saw no difference between your love for us and your obedience to the Father, to the plan, to giving your life away. And Jesus, you're the one we're following. May we step out of ourselves. May we repent daily for our selfishness and our sin. May we step into love, knowing pain, Sometimes death comes with it. Lord, thank you for telling us so clearly no greater love has a man than this than to give his life away. Lord, for those of us who choose to repent. May we also choose to give our lives away. And may we also appreciate, bless, pray for, love, not accuse, arouse suspicions. Lord, help us to love those who are sacrificing to bless us. Whether it's a mom who does untold things, works harder than most in the family, Or the dad who stays longer at work because he knows what the kids want and what they owe. Or the grandfather, the grandmother planning a, a legacy, a blessing, an inheritance. May we appreciate those things, Lord. Even as those things are getting harder and harder. Lord, may we follow you to the very end. May we trust you with our lives. 
May we fear neither fear nor death itself, for you've beaten both. Lord, what a blessing. What an honor to be called your people. Lord, we understand none of us deserve it. But it's an offer you make. And we thank you for it. And we appreciate, Lord, we don't fully understand, but we appreciate the sacrifices you made to bless us before we were even born. Lord, we usually close the service with the very prayer you gave us to say over people. The Lord bless you and keep you. But tonight, Lord, as surely as doing that is an act of love, Lord, tonight we... We don't ask for you to bless us and keep us. We ask that we would bless you and that we would keep your word and your love. So Lord, while you always bless and keep us, May we always, after this moment, seek to bless you and to keep your love and your word. For those that love us, for the unlovable, for the least of these, Christians who may hate us and call us names. The Lord, we read in your word that if they hate us, they're probably not Christians. So Lord, if we have hate for anyone tonight, may it melt in your presence. If we have any grudges, may they melt in your holiness. And Lord, may for the rest of our lives we bless you and keep your love and your word. In Hashem Yeshua, the name of Jesus, we give you this day, this night, and our very lives. Amen.